Today, as you may have noticed, we begin our fall series on reimagining the Ten Commandments. If we come from other faiths and traditions, we may not be familiar with the Exodus story, nor with what many consider to be its centerpiece, the Ten Commandments. If the Ten Commandments are relatively new to you, perhaps the easiest thing I could do this morning is recommend a movie for you. (laughs) There is a movie about the Ten Commandments. In fact, the title is The Ten Commandments. (laughs) And it was made by a big Hollywood studio, and the star of that movie was a member at First Church. This movie was made the year I was born. And yet, I was certain I remembered being at the initial showing of it in my hometown. Perhaps I remember an in utero experience because my mother, like so many other people, thought it was the greatest movie of all time. Having watched the movie again recently, though, I am hesitant to make this recommendation. (laughs) Please don't get me wrong. This movie is a masterpiece. Charlton Heston was in his prime, and he was filming this movie during the time he was sitting in these pews. That alone is enough to watch the movie. And his son, who played baby Moses in the film, was also baptized on this chancel that year. So my hesitation about saying, go watch this movie on Apple TV, you have to pay $2.99, comes from the fact that over the last 60 plus years, people have been watching this movie And believing everything in this movie is absolutely true. I think maybe you had to be an insider to understand it was a movie. (laughs) And not God speaking directly to you. It was, after all, a Cecil B. DeMille Hollywood blockbuster. I was reminded of this as I read an article in the LA Times last week about how one of my favorite shows, Only Murders in the Building, which is based in New York, is morphing this season into a marvelously funny Hollywood farce. Robert Lord wrote, the setting of the Paramount lot provides a nice dose of nostalgia. And one of the producers and stars of the show, Martin Short, said, I remember just like it was yesterday. I was 28, and I suddenly realized they shot a scene from the Ten Commandments against a fake ocean that was right over there. (laughs) If you've been to a Paramount tour, you've seen that fake ocean too, haven't you? So you may be wondering, in addition to the movie, why we're doing a series on the Ten Commandments now. There are several reasons, and at the top of the list is the need to reimagine these commandments in a way that will bring life instead of division and disunity. Writing Weeks after the 10th anniversary of 9-11, the gifted minister and writer, Kate Matthews Huey, reminded us that in the flow of time, every once in a while, the Ten Commandments provoke a measure of controversy in our public life. We are now living again in such a time. And when this happens, it is not about whether we actually obey them and keep their principles at the heart of our life together or how they might change the way we live if we observe them. We insist that would be an excellent controversy. But instead, in the United States, our national argument 
is about their display. Engraved in ironically real stone or fake stone and practically worshiped not for their content, but for the message they are assumed to convey. Huey pulls no punches when she writes, the Ten Commandments are assumed to convey that we are one nation under God, specifically in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Sadly, she says, the prominent display of these commandments serves to remind people of other faiths and atheists and agnostics as well about who we are whenever they walk into public buildings, regardless of the separation of church and state that protects us all, however futilely, from religious wars of one kind or another. While I feel fairly certain that 90% of us at First Church fall into the they category rather than the we category, because we are a people who have a little faith, a lot of faith, absolutely no faith, or we are of another faith. That is true of us. And we are also a people who do not need anything tacked on a wall to tell us who is in and who is out. We are committed to believing everybody is in, no matter how hard that may be at times. Interestingly, Huey reported that many of the people who have the strongest opinions about the display of the Ten Commandments when asked could only name four of the ten. Wouldn't you just love to know which four? <laughs> As a result, the Ten Commandments have become an idol for some and totally irrelevant for others. I think part of the inability to remember them is that their language does not translate for us in our time and place. That's why I'm so taken with the way our friends at In Flesh have reimagined these Ten Commandments. They have taken them off the shelf, blown the dust off, and beautifully retrieved the core of each one and made them accessible for you and for me. It is the mystery of God that makes this possible. While the Ten Commandments, along with the Bible, have become idols for many, we are continually reminded that this mystery is always evolving. God is not stagnant. God is not stationary. God is not bound to time and place. God is always and forever looking for new ways to get our attention, to remind us we all carry the original blessing within us, a blessing that was given to our ancestors long ago. No matter how God reveals God's self to us, to this world, to the earth we call home, all we can ever see is only a glimpse of the beauty of the divine presence that is in and through all things. On any given day when I'm not thinking, all I have to do on my way to church in the mornings. On any given day when I really look and pay attention to everything that's around me, still trying to drive in the right lane, of course. I am amazed at how many ideas come to me. I am amazed at how solutions to problems appear. And my staff is used to getting texts about all those things I'm thinking. And I am amazed when I arrive at my office after glimpsing the beauty of the divine in the children on the playground at Pilgrim School. And these days, to walk through the beautiful herbal and medicinal gardens while I'm doing that and taking those fragrances 
as I watch those beautiful children. I try on my way home each day to take Normandy all the way to Franklin. It's not my favorite side street, but believe me, the view of Griffith, Griffith Observatory is magical, especially if the sun is beginning to set in the west and the rays of its light are showcasing the place where the stars from the night sky will soon appear if you look through the telescope. Those glimpses of the divine make the first reimagined commandment much easier for me. I will admit, even after all these years, I still struggle with what the second reimagined commandment, practicing loyalty to the sacred, truly means. You may be wondering, where are those commandments? How are we going to read them? They're on social. They were in the meeting house. And then today, we're going to have cards for you that have the 10 on them also at coffee hour. So even though I struggle with what practicing loyalty to the sacred means, I have in these last few weeks thinking and preparing and meditating and talking a lot of theology with Reverend Michael as I wrestled with this commandments. I am beginning to believe practicing loyalty to the sacred is more about action than it is about belief. The gift of being your minister and sharing this life together is stretching my beliefs, even as it continues to uproot more of my old embedded theology that still exists. So I am learning. Practicing loyalty to the sacred happens when we live into a life that is rich in togetherness. Practicing loyalty to the sacred happens when we delight in our need for one another. Practicing loyalty to the sacred surprisingly happens at times when we are the ones who are suffering and when we are the ones who are dependent on the generosity of our siblings. Practicing loyalty to the sacred happens when we experience God's grace through those who reach out to us. Practicing loyalty to the sacred happens when we are called to practice solidarity and compassion with and for our suffering neighbors. Practicing loyalty to the sacred happens when we begin to desire to show up with and for those whose lives call us to action. And practicing loyalty to the sacred happens when we finally give thanks to God for weaving our lives so intimately together. This week, while I was getting my hair cut, there was a People magazine someone had left on the table in my hairdresser's station. The first thing I thought of was, is People magazine still a thing? And then I thought, wow, Rob Lowe looks really great because he was on the front. <laughs> and then I thought, how old is he actually? The headline of the article was The 10 Most Memorable Events of My Life. And no, I didn't read the magazine, so I don't really know what Rob's memorable events are, most memorable events are. But I couldn't stop thinking about my 10 memorable events. I'm finding this task isn't terribly hard. But of course, I've lived a lot longer than a lot of you. So I have a lot to choose from. 
after stopping at the store for the communion bread for today, when I got home, I told my husband about one of my memorable moments. And we agreed that the moment we met was life-changing for us. Our lives changed from that day on. As we work this fall with these 10 reimagined commandments, I am asking you over these next few weeks to think about your span of time on this earth and find the 10 most memorable events of your life. You may find they all come at once in a rush. You may have a hundred rather than ten. You may have to set a goal, though, of finding one a week as we do this together. My hope is that as we look and absorb these reimagined Ten Commandments together, we will be able to see all the glimpses of the divine that are continually coming to fruition around us, among us, and within us. May it be so for this day, and may it be so for all the days to come. Amen.